All right. Hello, my name is Clifton Johnson, and I am today's moderator. Nappy Roots is an American alternative Southern rap quartet that originated in Bowling Green, Kentucky in 1995, best known for the hit singles All Now, Poor Folks, Run the Globe, and Good Day. They were the best-selling hip-hop group in 2002. So give it up for Nappy Roots. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and just tell us a little bit about you and where you're from and what you're doing now. So. All right, how y'all doing? My name is Skinny DeVille. Um, sometimes I call myself the blues traveler. I used to be called the country poet because I just like putting words together. Um, I grew up, born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I'm sure some of y'all might know about Louisville from the Derby or Muhammad Ali or whatnot. We take a lot of pride in Louisville. You know, we think we're the best out of the world for some crazy reason. Um, but now I live in Atlanta, Georgia. You know, I had to move um, my family to Atlanta just for the business of music. I wanted to be around my kids as well as be around the music industry a lot more than what I was doing in Louisville. Um, I'm passionate about my career. Um, I look at my, my career as a career, not as chasing the next single. I'm not really a, a fame whore. I'd rather be respected than famous any day of the week. Um, it was kind of my decision to not be as famous as we used to be and to get off Atlanta Records when they tried to split my group up. So I took a leap of faith knowing that um, what I was doing and the music that I was making was going to get us a lot further than being famous and making singles every time they thought a single needed to be put out to keep the lights on. So um, that's me. They tried to call me the H&IC of the group. Um, I like to consider myself the heart of Nappy Roots, even though I'm not the end all be all to the decision making process. We are family and a team. So that's kind of my two cents to where I've been and what I've been doing. So, <clears throat> what up, Full Cell? They call me Buffalo Steel, the country cat in the cowboy hat. I've been doing this thing, man, since I was about 11 years old. I started rapping, um, doing shows, performing, uh, working on my craft, honing my skills. As an artist, as a writer, I like to call myself a writer who happens to rap. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm definitely more on the artist side of things. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I got a hip-hop quotable, um, famed hip-hop quotable from the Source magazine. Um, it's one of an uh, accolade that I'm very proud of, you know. Uh, man, right now I'm, I'm working on some solo stuff. Um, I'm very proud of what, of what we've done as Nappy Roots. Also you know, just the grind, and uh, I'm proud of what I do as an artist myself. And what's, what's, what we're about to do as Nappy Roots um, is something that we've never done before, which is brand um, each other, brand the artist. Like, you guys know us as Nappy Roots, uh, the one with the glasses, the dude with the cowboy hat, the fat boy, the tall cat, the dude with the, well, we have names, and we've been doing this thing, and we want people to know who we are, because we each bring something different to the table, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm more of a lyricist, um, and even though I look like the oldest, I'm the youngest out of Navy Roots, so. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a blessing, man, to be with these guys uh, ever since the beginning, and, you know, learning from these are my big brothers, you know, so. That's my two cent, man, Buffalo Steel. Yeah, what's good, yeah. Uh, my name is Ron Clutch, um, one-fourth of the famous Snappy Roots, world-famous Snappy Roots. I do what I love. I love what I do. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky as well. Um, one of my AKAs is the Goat Man. And another one is, I just adopted it today, it's um, Whip, the Rap Whip Whitaker. So, um... I'm just so fortunate and, and so blessed to be on the stage with my brothers right here and, and, and to be in front of you all. And, and hopefully I, we can say something that will inspire y'all to, you know, pursue y'all dreams and do what y'all love to do. You know, so, you know, that's what it is. All right. And I did just want to put out that uh, Fish Scales is still with the group. He's just not in today. He's an all-star weekend. He's balling in Houston right now. They wanted us to be there as Thanks well, so. and we decided that, you know, we can do both. We'll just send one that way, because y'all needed more of the attention, and the, y'all have the most love anyway, so. Y'all got three know. of us. They just got one. <laughs> yeah. be loose, so. Give it up. That's what's up. All right, so um, tell us about the group. How did y'all get together? What all started it? Where from? And how did y'all just continue to do the Biggie family? 
Well, Nappy Roots, we, we hooked up on the basis of education. And um, it's kind of in our bio. We went to school at West Kentucky University between the years of 93 and 97. Um, each year, a member came to school as a freshman. And me and Clutch were the first ones to kind of go and um, hook up. And we're all from Louisville, but we didn't know each other. And um, how we started was on a very humble struggle. We need to do something better than what we're doing because this ain't cutting the mustard. We was walking to class, and he's like, you know, we need to start a rap group. And this is after we heard Goody Miles' first album. And we was gone off Outkast and how they was the same age as we were, and they were speaking some of the same things, and they was just... You know, they was eloquent with their words to the point it was like, man, they made it look so easy. And we all had the passion of rapping and writing for whatever, but to actually do it as a serious career while you're going to school, that was something where we're from that's unheard of. No one's going to make it out of Kentucky. You'll never make it out of Kentucky. No one's done it. You need to pursue a real job. Think about your... And that's my mama telling me this, though. And it's like, you know what? All right, tell me one more time I can't do it. Mama, show you. She's like, you can't do it. I said, watch. And, you know, just off that and being on our own the first time, getting your first house with roommates and being a part of the real world as a 19, 20-year-old, you know, grown, growing man, you know, and bills. You know, you never seen a, a power bill of $400 and you don't know why. And you got four guys that don't have the money. And now you got to, you know, now there's no heat in the house and you still got to go to school and still learn. And those things is kind of what Goody Mob, you know, their first album kind of just hit so much, so close to home for us. And we was like, you know, let's start a rap group. We can do it. If they're doing it, and they're from Atlanta or Georgia, we can do it. And, you know, it, this is just my side of the story. But um, so we get back from class that day. I come back with a notebook. He comes back and goes plays video games. And I'm just writing and writing and writing and writing. And he's the barber of the crew. So um, over the Christmas break, we decided not to go home. We was working at UPS because Biggie said UPS was hiring. So... We went to UPS and got a job and got $8 an hour part-time, and his clippers broke. And, of course, we're still struggling to pay the power bill, so we can't really afford to get his clippers fixed. And next thing you know, my hair is starting to look like this. And I'm like, man, I'm so broke. My roots is nappy. I ain't got nothing. I'm eating Laffy Taffy, you know. And I'm just, my roots is nappy, my nappy roots. And then Lauren Hill said it on the end of the Fuji's Nappy Heads video. Me and my nappy roots. And I was like, huh. My nappy roots. And then, you know, he was like, yo, it's hot. And he said it. And then the next year, Scales played full, uh, full scholarship. He had a full ride to Western as a uh, basketball player, full scholarship. He comes in. We hook up after he goes to the military, and he starts saying it. And then I, he, he's friends with my little brother, and I found out he was coming to school. And I was like, you know, he's nice. I heard his mixtape. When you come to school, holler at us. I got something going on. He comes. He says it. So now everybody's saying Nappy Roots without it being an actual group. It's just a, a frame of mind. It's a movement of saying, I can be cool who I am. I'm going to hang around my, my, my friends, and we're going to do good and try to be the best at it. And one day, we might just get it. But, you know, everybody tells you, you're going to hit, you know, the worst time of your life. You can't do it. You're going to sign the worst deal as your first deal, and be careful who's out there. There's not a lot of good people that are going to help you. And so we just stuck to each other and our guns and what we knew. And this is over you know, four or five years of us evolving into, you know, when that room started, it was probably 10 or 15 of us running around, hanging around, that was cool. But we were, at the time, it was six of us that were rappers that were good at rapping. When it was a house party, we all showed up, 15, 20 freshmen, sophomores, juniors, but we was all hanging around each other because we just evolved around good music and having fun and looking out for each other. We wasn't a frat, but you could almost look at it like it was a fraternity of just good people. And it was, most of us were from Louisville. And, um... We was the ones that was always in the corner freestyling. You know, if anybody wanted to battle, you had to holler at him first. If you got past him, you had to holler at Scales. If you got past Scales, you had to see V. And I'm at the end. I don't even freestyle. I'm just, like, just chilling and grinning. You ain't going to make it is what he's going to yeah, You know, and, and if you had opportunity, we was right there with you trying to figure out how we can benefit off your opportunity and network. And so Nappy Root started off as a movement of like-minded people, that was trying to pursue education because we knew that if we didn't have education, we would all go back to where we was from. And that wasn't as fun as hanging around, smoking weed, getting drunk. You know, I might have been the oldest, he was the oldest, so, you know, we, he had to hang around us just to get to liquor. And, you know, it was, we threw the house parties, our house parties were the fattest, you know, we, we ended up being the seventh year seniors. You know, so I'm like Parker Lewis or Ice Cube off high learning. People had to come to see us to get the knowledge or the, the cheat sheets or how to learn how the ropes of school because if you didn't, you was gone in the semester. And how we always work was out of sight, out of mind. If you're not there, 
you don't really exist. And so if you don't exist, we're not really having the same conversation. So we knew we had to keep the grades up, we had to stay true to ourselves, we had to love hip hop for one and respect it to be the, the class act that we end up being as Napa Roots. So fast forward to 1998, two of our friends that were actually in our whole movement started, decided to open up a record store. And I was like, well, wait a minute, you can't open a record store without putting a studio in it because we about to do some big stuff. And so we went and partnered up with the record store. So on one side, they had the record store, and they sold everything from Brandy, uh, Master P, uh, to Twister, to Cash Money. Every, it, was a, it was a mom and pop setup started by um, students right across the railroad tracks from the campus. And it looked like a crack house. But when you went in, and it was all, we was always about the all factor. The outside doesn't matter. It's the inside that what counts. And when you went in, it was like, wow. We all took time, all of us. And we cut out each rapper out of every Source magazine, out of every, you know, every vibe, every artist that we thought was dope. We cut them out meticulously and painted them on the wall when you walk into the store. So you knew when you walked into the store that we had a respect for music. And there was a couch, there was some beads hanging, there was some incense, and it, on this wall was just all the music. And we said, you know what? This is how we're going to sell our music. Because if we can establish our credibility by selling people other people's music and recommending what's hot this week, it'd be very easy for them to buy music from us, and we say, yo, this is hot right here, they just came in, not knowing that it was us. So we put Nappy Roots on a shirt, and we sold it to the fraternities and sororities in their colors. So if it was AKAs, we gave them pink and green Nappy Roots shirts. If it was Alpha, we gave them black and gold. If it was Omega Psi 5, we gave them purple and gold. And if it was uh, Omega, uh, Cap Alpha Psi, we gave them a white shirt with red letters. And we had the fraternity sororities wearing Nappy Roots, and no one knew it was a rap group. They just knew the Nappy Roots name and it identified with them, somehow, some way, they identified with the word Nappy Roots. And it, it sold, bam, everybody was wearing Nappy Roots shirts. About three months later, here comes the CD. And it was, we didn't put our face on it, we really rarely put our face on CDs, except for like one. Because we want to sell the music, not the group, and not the image of us. Because if you're going off an image, a lot of times people just credit your music because of how you're looking. And this was right around the bling bling era. This is, you know, pen and pixel graphics, Master P had the, 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 the dog with the do solid gold collar. Yeah, it was all fake, fabricated stuff, but you know, at that time, it was just music and people liked it. So we said, we're gonna, I had my cousin draw a nappy-headed dude, and people say it was the image of me, but I highly dispute that. But if you look at the Nappy Roots logo, and we all end up getting it as a tattoo, but this is the image we put on our CD. And three months after we started selling shirts is when we put the CD in the store that we actually worked at and sold our music from, and no one knew on the other side we was making music. No one knew. They just knew every, at the class, we all shot across the street, and we was not in the scene of what the normal college students were doing. They knew we was up to something. And so at the end of the year, I made sure, this is the point, at the end of the year, we make sure our music is in the, our store, and everybody, before they go home for college, goes home with the new music. Because everybody wants to go home to the little brother or their friends on the block and say, this is the new hottest, you don't have this, I bet you don't got this. And it was good music. And we recorded our first album on a rolling VS-880. And if you want to go back that far and know how hard that is now, it's like we had, we couldn't nowhere near afford an SSL to even be a part of that, but we know we couldn't afford studio time either. So we, we shelled up a bunch of our, um, our residual checks. We got two investors that had great grades, and they had their checks. They didn't want to do nothing with it, and they invested in our studio. And that's how we got our first CD into our store. And that's how we established our credibility of saying, okay, these guys know what they're talking about. And the CD was good. So everybody went home that May with this new Nappy Roots CD. And we made about 1,000 copies of these off the Roland VS880 CD burner. And that's real-time CD burning. That's exactly an hour to make a CD. <laughs> Someone had to sit there and burn each one. And it, and it crashed every 10 to 15 CDs. It would crash. It would start all over again. And this was like a, a week process. I mean, we had, we had to take shifts. And he'll tell you, I took a shift, and I was in there. And I went home and slept, and he took a shift. And that's how we created this, this initial thought of, wow, these guys just did something that no one else on the campus could do. They made a CD when tapes were selling. And we made a CD because everybody kept taking our tapes. <laughs> we, had, we made five songs, we played around, someone took it, we didn't have it back, I need another copy. Where happened to your copies? My boy got it. Come on, man. So fast forward again, three months into that, this is the, the first summer of us putting on our first CD, Country Fried Sess, that we used the art department of school to help design and help make the graphics. The, the uh, art major, gave, he colored the, my guys, uh, my cousin's drawing in. He did the back, he did the, the credits. 
He did it all. That was the art department of Western Kentucky University, not us hiring someone, us using a student, our friend, and networking and using the relationships of the school to get something that we had to get done completed. So here it is, July of 1998, our first CD's out. We're hanging around campus, and we're just lounging, and next thing you know, we get a call to the store. This is Mike Karen from Atlantic Records. I want to have a meeting with you guys. And initially, uh, one of our friends who worked at the store thought it was a prank. He hung up on him. And he was like, who is that, man? Somebody from somebody saying it was some record label. He called right back and said, yo, I'm serious. Don't hang up on me again. I want to have a meeting with you guys. And can you guys, you know, when can we do it? And from that, it was like, oh, shit. We didn't try to get a deal. We was just doing what we wanted to do and was passionate about our music. And the opportunity came to us. And that summer, we sat down with him. And he came, and he took us out to eat in Nashville, um, Hard Rock Cafe, matter of fact. Our plan in Hollywood, matter of fact. And he was like, yo, I want to sign you guys. And he was like, for real? We from Kentucky, if you don't know that or not. Like, it's not like we're coming from a major city like most people at that time were coming from. Like, at that time, you had to really be either tap dancing at the record label and doing a, a jig just to get up there, or you had to keep sending demos. And we was like, we're never going to play that demo game. We're not going to do it. We're just going to sell our music like Master P did it, and we're going to just start from the ground up. And it was not a question in our mind that that's how it was supposed to be for us. Fast forward to October, the deal is done. We're signed to Atlantic Records. We still have two or three years left in college. And um, it was a big to-do. Everybody knew that these guys are going to do something very powerful in the future. And they supported it because we gave them an opportunity to see themselves and us through the Napa Roo shirts. And we had established a brand in college using the students and the, the, the real world scenario to a small, I would say test sample, for example. And if it worked in school, it could work anywhere. If you could sell to, you know, uh, the, the white sorority girls and they like your music, and you could sell to the Asian dude, or you could sell to the, to the thug guys from Florida that play football, and you could sell to the guys in Georgia that play basketball, and you could sell to the guy in New York. You, you ain't doing so hot. I mean, so bad for yourself. You might have opportunity to do something. So that's what gave us the confidence to say, okay, let's go ahead and make this, this leap of faith and sign this 60-page contract that nobody could read. We got a lawyer. But to me, the best feeling was to go back to my mama and show the 60-page contract and say, I told you. She said, I know you could do it. I just want to push you to make you do it. But she also said, graduate school because you need a plan B if this doesn't work out. And so for that, for us to go to have a record deal, driving 45 to an hour after class down to Nashville. When I walked into that room at it, 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 uh, Music Row and saw my first SSL and all those knobs and buttons in the booth and the person that met you at the, at the, the counter and said, hey, and you got the candy and the cookies. <laughs> I was like, man, I could die now. Like, I couldn't get the grin off my face for like three hours. And I was like, oh, we made it. That was when I finally realized we made it. And we didn't even make it. That was just the beginning. That was 1998. Our album didn't come out to 2002, and that was the second album we cut for them. The first album sat on the shelf because they didn't know how to market it. They didn't know what to do with some guys from Kentucky. And we was like, well, we don't know either. We just made the music. You guys got to figure it out. And our a and Mike Karen was so passionate about us. He said, guys, I know we just went through the budget. We blew through $30,000 making this project in a month. And I'm sure some people probably took something out of it, and he paid some people off. But that's just paying dues. But he was like, we got to do it again, man. They can't do nothing with this. And it was like, ah. And, you know, we went down to Atlanta. Every, every weekend, we went to Atlanta. And that's not no easy feat for college students, to drive from Kentucky all the way down to Atlanta on the weekends just to find Jazzy Faye. We had to find Jazzy Faye. Jazzy Faye was going to give us our break. We just got to get to Jazzy Faye. And Jazzy Faye blew us off four or five times. We had a guy that said, I'm a manager, I can help y'all out. Jazzy Faye's the dude. We went to 112, hung out in the booth right beside Jazzy Faye. We were so close to Jazzy Faye, you could smell his cologne. And he, he would give you, Dad, what up? But he would just go off and do it. He was not thinking about nobody, but he shouldn't. He didn't have to. We had to position ourselves to be that type of artist. You have to make yourself accessible and sexy. You have to do that to get your attention sometimes to other people without selling yourself. So we did that four or five times, and the last time we was like, if we don't get the Jazzy's fade, we're going to fight you, because you keep saying it's all set up. And this is costing us money. College students don't live off that a lot of money, man. This is, we're taking $25 a piece, we're pitching in on gas, we're sleeping on floors, sleeping at Scale's cousin's house on his floor just to find Jazzy Faye. 
When we end up the last, the last time, we end up running to a guy named Groove Chambers. And Groove Chambers pretty much saved our life because he's the one that came up with the all naw, the, the track all naw. And it was in his house on his Roland 1680 <laughs> that in his MP, his, uh, his, he had a, a Kai 2000. This is the Kai 2000 and a 1680, and we came up with all naw in his living room. But this is after I had graduated, I had sacrificed my job. I left my child with Clutch, because we was roommates. I left my child with him and my girl, and I said, I'll be back with something. Well, I made two, three or four records. I said, still, I got something. Come down here. Still, and Prophet hopped on a Greyhound and came down to Atlanta. We're here. What's up? We had set it out. We had Hustler, and we had just started making All Now. We made All Now as soon as we made it. Now, just keep in mind, over the course of four years, in our own studio, we're making records, demoing them, sent to Atlantic. We had to send a record. Every time we made it, we had to send it to Atlantic just for him to get approval from Craig Coleman, just to get some money to go back in the studio and recut it. That's a bad place to be. You have to demo and tap dance just to get a record, a budget. And that's where we was at at the time. For four years, we did that. Is this cool enough? No, it needs to be more like, why don't you do like what Trick Daddy's doing? Why don't you be more like what Trina or Brandy or think, look at Twisted, look, you know, it's like, man, we're not none of those people. We're Nappy Roots. And it's, we're like Wu-Tang, but we, we have a grind like cash money. You know, we want to be like the hot boys and do different stuff, but it's not like that yet. It's not, it wasn't the time. So I know I'm jumping around, but just, so we, we're down here in Atlanta, sleeping on floors. We make all now. I send it to him. Overnight, that next morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, he calls me. You done it. <laughs> you done it. Finally, you done it. And I'm like, word, okay. <laughs> Boom, I'm coming down. So he flew from L.A., flew into Atlanta. We're down in Atlanta staying with Scale's cousin. Scale's on the couch. His cousin has a spot upstairs. We're on the floor. It's bad, man. I mean, we have like no money. We're sharing biscuits. Like we're sharing, like whatever we can share, we're sharing because we know that one person can't fall because if he falls, then we all fall. It's a team. We're a family. If he's hungry, then I'm gonna be hungry. But if he's eating, I'm gonna eat. And so we're all down in Atlanta, and guess who walks in the door? Jazzy Faye. Groove Chambers makes the beat. Jazzy Faye comes in. Oh boy, he comes in, sings the hook. That was already sung. Yeah, Groove, Groove did, Gook was already there. We just needed a famous person to give us our ghetto pass in Atlanta because we knew Atlanta was the mecca of Southern hip hop. We had to have Atlanta. Without that, you don't have, you don't have it all. You don't have it. You can be a hot as hell in Kentucky, but if you ain't got Atlanta, man, it's like, the, it's like the elections, man. You can lose a couple states and still win the election, but if you don't have Atlanta, <laughs> hang it up, man, hang it up. So, so that was it. And that's how we got started as Snappy Roots for the world to know who we are. It's a bunch of struggle. It's a bunch of... But between all of that, we believed in ourselves. We took the time to make great music, and we stuck together. And I know over the years we've lost a couple members, but that's just because we've gotten older and we all know what we want to do in life. And as you get older, you, just, you don't want to keep doing the same thing. You want to broaden your horizons. And so for Snappy Roots to... We lost members, but we never lost the family. They're still our brothers, even though they're not around. They just pursue solo careers because they just want to do something else. And that's cool. But what we've always had is a camaraderie and brotherhood to know that this is bigger than just what we do. We're influencing, now we're influencing y'all. Like, who would have thought if someone said you guys would have been teaching or talking to students about education at a technical level that most people don't understand, and y'all could probably tell me everything, but what I can show y'all is the real world struggles of failing and failing and failing, but that one time you didn't give up and you sacrificed it all. Like I said, I left my son and my girlfriend with this guy. <laughs> Come on, like. <laughs> like, that's a, <laughs> but I had to do it. I had to quit my job at the TV station. I graduated, was working at the TV station. My, my major was uh, radio and television. But when I got signed, I got a journal studies to take what I wanted to take to learn things that were outside that, because I knew that I had a record deal, and I knew I had to learn internet marketing, I had to learn family management and planning, know how to invest the money I was going to make. I took a lot of stuff that I needed to take to apply. It was also my own personal full sale. And I would tell all of y'all, take what you want to take and what you need to take, but follow your dreams, because you never know when you're going to come up with that all now moment. And when you do, be prepared to handle that all-naw moment. And after that, it was still two more years of struggle before we got on. It was nine months of working all-naw before they even knew it was all-naw. Another six months of po' folks. You know, and once, you got, once we got on, it was 
you know, and I'll say this real quick, to get on is one thing, but to maintain that success and stay on is a whole nother set. And we're looking at this as a career. We're career artists, not one hit wonders, not fame whores. This is a career. We do this because we're passionate about it and we love to do it. If you have that and you keep God in your life and you're educated about the rights and wrongs and the reals and evils, success ain't too far away from that. That's the story of Nappy Roots. That's what's up. That was a whole presentation right there. We finished. No. <laughs> I heard you speaking on education a lot, so I just want to ask, be still. I know you, you say you're the youngest one. How old are you? That's, that's uh, <laughs> confidential. <laughs> no, but um, since you're the youngest, how was it growing up with that education mindset coming from your family, basically? And did anybody in, the, uh, did anybody in Nappy Roots ever fail or lack off in education and have the other people pick them up? Or Man, how work? I mean, I don't know, you know, cause, but when I came, it was just like um, I, got, I got the golden ticket because I was the last one. So I, they, they knew what teachers I should go to and, you know, who's the student aide that you need to holler at because she might got the answer. So you might want uh, – and this teacher keeps giving the same test over and over and here's the final that, you know, we had. So they will hook me up on that note. But don't do that. Don't do that. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't learn that way. But I'm just saying, like, as far as education goes, you know, the, you know, as, as um, in my life, my mother was always a stickler on education. You know, she was the first person in her family to get her college degree. And, uh, and she got that when, she, when we were grown. You know what I'm saying? So she went back to college and got her degree. But my father, he had always been a, a musician. You know what I'm saying? And so he... He was always like, uh, yeah, how many songs you write today, son? How many, you know, let's go down here and practice. And my mother, you know, she's like, uh, you know, get on that homework. But, you know, I guess, I guess he knew that she was going to stick to me on that note, on education. So he didn't really bother too much about it. You know, he's a country boy. Education was far from his, uh, you know, his, his spectrum. He didn't really, he believed in, in, in um, following your dreams. So he, he instilled that into me too. But, man, I mean... It was a blast, man. I mean, like going to college, because I didn't know I was going. I didn't know I was going to college at all. Um, I actually took the ACT the very last time you could take it, and uh, I ended up making just enough of a grade to be able to get into college. And I was supposed to play football. I was supposed to get a scholarship to play football for Western, but uh, like I said, you know, I really didn't even know about going to college. Nobody where I'm from was even talking about college. Clutch could say the same thing. We grew up in the same neighborhood where it was like, you going to college? Yo, square ass, you know, you know, so, you know what I mean? So we, that, that, that wasn't really, I was almost embarrassed to say it, you know, but it was just a blessing to take that leap of faith. And sometimes you do got to take that leap and you got to work at it. And then, um, but education wise, you know, we, we all got our, us three got our degrees. And um, I'm still learning, man. I still read. I still, I still like, um, I, I want to do a lot more other than just being an artist. You know what I mean? Like I, I just, me and Clutch just started a, um, Clothing company, clothing line, right? Tell a us about the clothing line. A collegiate clothing company, uh, Louisville, University of Louisville. Um, we're getting licensed uh, by, the, by the CLC, the, the uh, collegiate licensing company, to be able to put the university's logos on our, on our clothes and stuff like that. So that's a huge deal when you got a, got a university that sells millions and millions of dollars of merch um, just by having that little car and a bird on it. So it's called Bird Gang. Uh, if you can go to my website if y'all want to. I am birdgang.com. I told somebody I wasn't going to solicit today, but <laughs> it's called I am birdgang.com, and I'm proud of that too, man. So, but uh, I, I wanted to, to touch on some of the other stuff that Skinny missed, like um, me being the youngest one in the group, like I was wide eyed, bright eyed, bushy tail, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but uh, when, when it came to, um, when it came to like being able to handle success and all of that, like, um, we, we kind of took, I think Skinny might have touched on this, we kind of took Western Kentucky as our own little world, you know what I'm saying? And, and we pretty much took the world over. That was our world, you know what I mean? So it was our, it was our everything. And uh, we, we did the radio on Wednesday nights. We get up there and freestyle on the radio, you know what I'm saying? And the first time, you know, we in the car, we in Clutch's car, we hear our, our song on the radio, we pulled up, we, you know, I thought we had made it then. This was in college, you know? We damn near wrecked, we pulled over in the gas station. We had to listen to it, you know what I'm saying? Like, we was in college. So, um, Country road, that was bro. cool. We, uh, when we inked the deal, we signed the deal, and this is the, this is, this is the most heartbreaking story. I, um, my father had a Benz that he loved, man. He uh, handed it down to me, passed it down. It was his worst mistake ever. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm in college, you know what I'm saying, with a, with a Mercedes, you know what I mean? 
I had that mom. I had it for two months. He had it for years. But see, here's what here's what happened. So we we inked the deal. We signed the deal. And um, I'm thinking, man, you know, it's we we on. We get a we get a write up in the College Herald, the newspaper. You know what I'm saying? It comes out every every uh, Tuesday or Thursday or something like that. So everybody rushed to get the paper with Nappy Roots signing Atlantic Records contract on the front page of the College Herald. And um, I couldn't find no paper nowhere. You know what I mean? I'm going to different, you know, I'm going up to Grice, I'm going up to different buildings, you know, looking for a, a newspaper so I can have it. And uh, I went to one more spot, and um, you know how it is on campus, you can't find no parking space. Well, not, maybe not here, I don't know, but where we was from, parking space was limited. So I seen this little parking space, it was raining, and I, I was trying to hurry up and whip in the, the spot before, uh, before somebody took the magazine, man. I went in there, tore my bins all to hell, man, just to try to get a, a Nappy Roots uh, magazine that really was the College Herald. It wasn't like it was, you know, USA Today or something like that. <laughs> but um, but that, just, that, that just lets you know, man, how, you know, these, the little things in life, it, it makes you really appreciate it, you know, especially when, when the big things do come, the Grammy nominations do come. And uh, the platinum album, the plaques come, and you know you get to meet, rub elbows with with some of the most famous producers, some of the most uh, famous mixers and, and engineers, and you know movie directors and everything. So it's a, it was a beautiful thing, and it started off in college, and we got the uh, experience then. So I mean, I had made it really before we did made it, make it. That's how I felt. All right, uh, Ryan, a question for you. Uh, I know you and B still grew up together. Just in general, how was it uh, coming out of where you came from? How was it compared to the people telling you, you're going to be good, you can do this, compared to like your best friends or your friends being like, man, you ain't nothing. Like, what was the difference and what made you succeed through that? Um, we came from the same area, me and Buffalo, but we didn't know each other until we got to Western Kentucky University. But um, like Steel was saying, you know, our situations were similar. Like, I was the first person in my family to go to college. And when I told my friends I was going to college, they was like, you know, they was kind of like, man, you leaving us. You know, it kind of disappointed. But um, I got to college, I, I really didn't start, I didn't really pick up a pen and paper and really take rapping serious till like 96. Like Skinny said, when I heard Goody Mob, I heard their story and I was like, okay, they're not talking about uh, materialistic things in life. It was, you know, they was talking about the struggle. They was talking about everyday living. And that kind of inspired me, gave me the motivation to be like, okay, I can talk about, you know, my regular life and what I'm going through. So, um, you know, that was, um, that was the moment where I was like, okay, I, I want to do this, you know. I want to I wanna, I wanna, uh, express myself um, lyrically, I want to, um, you know, make music and not really concerned about the money or where we was going to go, you know, not knowing if we was going to be where we are right now on the stage talking to y'all. It was just, you know, just the love of, you know, making music, you know, the love of hip hop and, uh, you know, the love for my brothers. So, um, like I said, I, I didn't start till like 96, but you know, you know, once you get that bug for writing and, and, and um, that, that boom bap, man, you know, it's like, you know, it's, conta you know, it's, it's, it's damn near like a drug. You know, when you hear that beat, it's like, okay, you know, everything else, nothing else matters, you know. All you hear is that beat and then, you, you know, your mind gets to going. You know, I don't know how many of y'all in here is making music, but, um, you know, it's... it's it's definitely a gift from God. I was, I was talking to someone yesterday at, the, um, at, at President Gary's house, and he was at, uh, I don't know how we got on the subject, but we was talking about, like, why is hip-hop so contagious? Why is it, like, you know, taking over the world? And my theory is, it's like when you and your mama's stomach, you know, your first beat is your mama's heartbeat, and it's like, doom, 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 doom. So when you hear that, it's like, okay, you know, it's, it's like you're a robot, and, you know, you got to respond to it. So, um...
And what was the question again? Uh, nah, look, let me. <laughs> it's been a long night. Hey, it was good though. Yo, it was good. Like I no, said, no. we we kicked it hard last night. <laughs> what, what am I? I don't know what to do with my hands. No, nah, no. Nah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Talking about growing up in Newburgh. Um, I come. I, I was born in the West End of Louisville. I moved to uh, my family moved to to Newburgh, which is like the south side of Louisville. And um, Skinny might have touched on it earlier. You know, it was you know, a lot of folks was just happy with just rapping around the neighborhood, which was cool. But us going to college really opened our eyes to like a whole different world, you know. Just um, being on campus with, with graphic designers, being on campus with, with radio folks, being on campus with folks that was studying psychology and just a whole bunch of different races was just like, okay, this is, it really, it was, it was really like an eye opener. And I, you know, just looking out in the crowd now to y'all was like, okay, this is similar, it's a few more black folks, but it's a similar to how we, to our situation. And being, going to college, like, just, like, just really changed my life to where it was like, okay, this is, this is a step in the right direction. And this is like, okay, this is life. And then coming back, like, during summer, the summer break, and seeing my old friends, they, you know, a couple of my friends, they was like, they came to college just because I came to college. They didn't know what they wanted to do. Um, a friend, uh, DJ Curlis in, in, in particular, he was like, man, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to get out of here, and I want to pursue something. I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to go with my heart. And, and you know, and it, right now he's in Nashville. He's actually, he's, you know, he's doing some big things. So the fact that y'all here now, I don't know where y'all from, but y'all here now, lets us know, let you, should let yourself know that, okay, you, you know, you're pursuing something other than just the run of the mill. You're not letting nobody tell you what you need to do or what you can't do. So, you know, when, uh, I'm trying to think what my man still said. He said, um, follow your dreams. How's it going? The lyric, um, basically follow your dreams. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, you know, be a leader. It, it, it probably rhymes with something. It probably rhymes. Here we go. It, it's it's be a leader and follow your dreams. Oh, yeah. You know, when you when you when you don't have a clue what you want to do, follow your heart. I tell you, follow to, your dreams. I tell you how to be a leader. Just follow your dreams. Yeah. There you go. That's what's up. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is three questions. This is for uh, each one of you guys. So we're gonna ask, um, how does it feel to have a multi-platinum album under your belt? And then also tell us about networking. Who would you like to network with? Who would you like to collab with? And this is an individual question, so all y'all can answer that. Um, at the time, when we first came out, uh, Waterman Chicken and Grits, I think it was February uh, 25th, maybe, of 2002, somewhere around then the album came out. The album went gold within five to seven weeks after that um, came out. And keep in mind, we're coming from Kentucky. No one's came out of Kentucky, and we're fresh-faced. And this is the same time the Bling Bling era is hardcore. I mean, hardcore. If you weren't talking about a Bentley and the Gucci and the Prada, Cash Money was killing, like they're doing now, but they was killing the game in the late 90s. This is after Biggie and Pac died. This is straight up, you know, this is, this is a materialistic world, early 2000s. And I hate to say it, but it wasn't until the world trade, you know, situation happened where it kind of humbled the world to say it's not about all this materialistic stuff, it's about family. That allowed us to have a platform to speak on things that were not materialistic, but about family and, you know, that. So coming out of that, I don't think if that happened, we probably wouldn't have sold nothing. But because it did allow people to really calm down and let the water kind of settle. Because of that, we sold um, gold in five to seven weeks. We went platinum. By the summer, it was platinum. That feeling to know that what you did all these years allowed you to sell to a million people. Now, Napster had already came out. And keep in mind, iTunes was not even in existence in 2002. The first iPod looked like an old dope dealer cell phone. It was huge. <laughs> like, there was no really buying music online. Now, Napster had killed the game in regards to free downloads. For the fact that you could still sell a million records, we was like one of the last groups to do that. And the record label, they was like, you guys don't know what you did. 
And they said, we'd rather you had worked another way, like worked your way up to platinum, not just come out platinum first. Because when you come out platinum, I mean, there's a lot of ego involved in platinum records. It's a lot of ego. You think that you're the star, you're the end all be all, everybody is calling you. You got to change your phone number three or four times a month because a lot of people you give your number out are not good people. A lot of people are chasing you for the wrong reasons. And that's where fame and ego don't, they don't mix. Like, Oil and water. It's just not a good mix when you have a, a big ego and you're famous. You become a jerk, an asshole, and it's not, it's not good. And I was very cautious in my success at that time not to get egotistical. I think me and the Lord had a conversation, and he was like, Skinny or Son or William, however you want to be called, I'm going to bless you. But the minute, that, the minute you take my blessing and start disrespecting people and taking it for granted, I'm going to take it from you. And it's, it's almost as if he said it just like that. And I was like, all right. Even though I, I, signed my, I signed a contract for the money, sex, and drugs, because that's what the a &R said I would get if I signed this contract. So I pretty much felt like I sold my soul to the devil just to have an opportunity to influence people. But I feel like I got it back by not being egotistical and not taking the fame. But that was the best feeling in the world to sell a million records coming from Kentucky where no one has ever done that. There's so many people that are talented that come from Kentucky. But we're the only group out of the whole state, out of four million people that live in this state, that out of five of us are from Kentucky. We're the only five that actually sold a million records to this day. But now, and there was a real, when we got off Atlantic Records in 2005, because we chose to, between 2005 and 2008, I was really upset about that platinum plaque. I was like, man, my son cannot eat this platinum plaque. It's not a plate. It's sat on the wall looking nice, but that don't, the power company don't care about this platinum plaque. You know, and you sure the hell can't find it. <laughs> and there was, and that was another leap of faith that we decided to take just to keep it going. But that right there showed me that the platinum success, it doesn't really mean nothing. It was a good mark to have, and you can say you accomplished some things. And if that's what you want in life is to sell a million records, then go for it. But what I've learned is from that is not to pursue the platinum plaque, it's to pursue happiness and love what you do, and you'll be better. I, I asked these guys yesterday, what would you rather have, wealth or health? And off top, health. We said in, 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 in almost the same time, health. So the platinum plaque is not what drove, it drives me now to, to do it again. It's about loving what I want to do, you know, and the success is great, but what you do with the success and how you take it and manifest it to your own personal career, you know, if you want to be a career anything, it's not about the first accolade. It's about all of them lined up like dominoes. And you, once you line them up like dominoes and you push that one, when you're done, after all your dominoes are lined up, it can be this elaborate thing that everybody's in awe about. But one domino doesn't mean nothing. You can flick that over. I don't, okay, now what? 100,000 dominoes. Now it's going up the wall and going down and sliding and flipping. And that's what you want out of your life. You should anyway. It's the, you want to end on a high note. People talking about you and saying great things about you. That's how you live forever. You don't live forever by being a jerk and throwing money at people and you better do this so I'm going to fire you. That don't, that don't get you nowhere. And that's what I've taken from my platinum status is when I was at my highest, I was still the same person at my lowest. And I'd rather be on the curb than on a pedestal because people fall off the pedestal and they break their legs, ankles, they get up limping. I'm sitting on the curb. I can get up and walk away and say it was a hell of a ride. I, I did that. But it's so much more I want to do in my life that the platinum plaque is just, it's just a wall. It's just a wall decoration. I, I want to say I, I can't. Um, I wish I was like that, you know. Like I, I, I did. I, I mean, I did it big. When we when we was getting it, I was I felt the other way. You know what I'm saying? I felt like you will work hard for your money. You know what I'm saying? And you know, I work hard for this and shit. You, you know, you you know, if I'm gonna give this to you, you know what I'm saying? I need to get what I want. You know what I mean? How I want it. You know what I'm saying? But I mean. I grew. It didn't out? work out. It didn't work out. I tell you, it's, it, hum it's it right, no really. Try. It humbles you. It, you get humbled. It's kind of like um, you on this you on this roller coaster, man, and you don't really understand what's going on. You just enjoying the ride, but sooner or later that roller coaster is gonna stop. And then what? You see what I'm saying? So so you know, I mean, you have to definitely you know respect the people who who. Uh, you meet coming up because they might be the same people you meet going down too. So, you know what I mean? Like this is this is just like, it's still a blessing to be in, in the game 10 years later, you know what I mean? Like we've been a time capsule bubble. You guys keep getting younger to us, 
You see what I'm saying? Y'all, y'all, y'all will go on and, and go on for the rest of your life and do what you do once you graduate. We might come back here three, four years later and look at the same people, young guys too. So we've been in, a, young women and, and men, we've been in a time cap. So we've been in a bubble for 10 years. You see what I'm saying? So, I mean, once you're in it, you really don't, you can't, I mean, I have people calling me like, yeah, you, you know, you was just on so-and-so, you know, you, you, I just turned on the TV, blah, blah, blah. And we on the road, we don't see none of that. We don't, we don't see none of it. We inside of the roller coaster, you know what I mean? So if you ever get a chance, and, and like I said, and, and each of you will, if you, if you keep pursuing what you want to do and, and uh, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it, but you get the chance to succeed, actually succeed in life, man. Enjoy, enjoy it. But respect it too, because it, it could turn around and bite you at the end of the day, man. So, like I said, I, I, I was humble. I've been humble. I'm, I'm back again doing my thing, working my way back up that ladder. And I did, um, I did have a good relationship with people. That's one thing about me. I do keep contact with people, um, and I do have a relation, good relationship with people. But I know I did do some things that you might uh, expect from a su super st celebrity. You know what I'm saying? But uh, hey. It's just what it is. You see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm man enough to say that was a mistake. You know what I mean? But, but you enjoy it, though. You enjoy your life. Enjoy your success. At the same time, man, you know, you might have a guy in this room right now that uh, might be, you know, have all the accolades in the world. You know what I'm saying? Done way more than you'll ever do in two or three lifetimes. And he's sitting around chilling in some buddies in some old jeans or something. You know what I'm saying? And, and he ain't tripping on you know, acting, acting a fool, acting any type of, you know, putting on airs, acting any type of way. So, you know, those are the type of people that you should respect and want to aspire to be like, man. Don't be like, you know, don't be like a jerk because I tell you what, we've been around for a long time and we've seen a lot of artists come and go. The hottest people that you, that was on the radio, I mean, you, you can go through them. Where's Young Jock at? You know what I'm saying? Where, 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 where I mean, it's a, I'm a, we we, we, we real, we keeping it real, right? They, they might say the same thing about Nappy Roos, but Nappy Roos has been grinding though. Nappy Roos, and Young Jock might have been grinding too. He still might be grinding. But what I'm saying is, even with Nappy Roos, you go to Twitter, everybody will be like, what happened to Nappy Roos? Well, we at Full Sail right now. Where are you What you doing? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we talking, we, we still on up, but we still grinding. But nobody stays on top forever. You see what I'm saying? What happened to the people that was so super hot? They don't stay hot. Every flame gonna eventually burn down a little bit. You know what I'm saying? If you if you done stockpile some gas, you know what I'm saying, some lighters, you might can relight that, rekindle that flame or holler at somebody else. He kept he might have kept the torch lit when mine burnt out. And I put mine on his, you know what I'm saying, and got my got mine lit back up. So, you know, like I said, it's just really about, you know, it, do enjoy your success, but at the same time, man, you know, we are humans and uh, you gotta treat people with respect, man. So and, and that's just that's just the life lesson, you know. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Yeah, and, and as far as your second part of the question, though, um, who would I would like to work with? Um, I have a crush, man, on Sade, man. So I love that woman, bro. I love that woman. And so if you're watching Sade, I want to do a song with you. <laughs> yeah, for free. You know what I'm saying? I do it for free. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. But real talk, though, yeah. I would love to do a song with that woman. She's an amazing artist to me. Okay, so man, the question was. <laughs> Don't worry, that was just after, last night. And last night, <laughs> after selling a million records, <laughs> how did it feel? Uh, initially, it was it was kind of surreal because that means like a million folks. And you, you also can count the two million people that download illegally downloaded it. So that's like a three three million people love your music. And um, they feel how you feel. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a feeling that I can't really, it's, it's, it's hard to put into words, you know. Rapping afforded us the ability to go to spots like Italy, Kuwait, um, Iraq, you know, the list goes on and on. And, and to, like, to go to Kuwait and be with the Sheik of Iran you know, he, I can't really understand what he's saying. He probably understand what I'm saying, but he, he knows when he hear that song, he's like, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a, that's a feeling like, okay, man, this is, this is bigger than, you know, us. This is on some spiritual. So, um, you know, it's a great feeling. 
And, you know, my story is similar to what Skinny was saying and still and said. I, you know, I was humble, but then I had moments where I was just like, I was balling out. I go to the bar and, you know, perfect strangers, what you want? All right, I'm buying drinks, doing this and doing that. And then you get to a point where it's like, okay, you know, my, my expenses are <laughs> up here. <laughs> but then what's coming in is down here. And then it's like, okay, I got to go into, um, I got to go back into my, you know, my mode where it's like I'm being more responsible with my money. But you live and you learn. And we fortunate enough to, to, to still be here in front of y'all telling our story, doing what we love to do. You know, we're not billionaires, but we, we're able to do what we love to do and still pay our bills and take care of our family. So to me, that's rich. You know, that's successful. I, you know, I'd rather be doing something I love to do and not getting a lot of money than doing something that, you know, I'm dreading getting up and going to work. And, you know, my boss is a jerk. You know, I trade that any day of the, of the week, you know. So the second part of the question was, who do I want to work with? And I was sitting here thinking, like, okay, who would I love to work with? And being here, we did met some amazing people, you know. Dave Pensado, for one, I don't know if y'all familiar with him. Put him on the spot. Secretly in the back. That was an introduction, you missed it. Yeah, so. <laughs> so y'all get a chance, Google this guy, Dave Pensado, world-class mixer. <laughs> hey, Google. And we was in the, the room across the hall, we met um, Ed Jones, and he's like, you know, a big dude as far as making films. He's, he's partly responsible for like, uh, what, Empire Strikes Back, you know, some other films that you probably love. So, Roger Rabbit. Who framed Roger Rabbit? Who framed Roger Rabbit? So right now, man, y'all on campus with like some, you know, I don't know if y'all went to the, the induction ceremony yesterday, the Hall of Fame, but that was like, that was bigger than the Grammys. And we'd have been to the Grammys. The Grammys is kind of boring. It's kind of overrated. <laughs> but um, yesterday, I was, man, I was impressed. Like, okay, this is, this is you know, this is major. This is big. This is bigger, you know, than, like I said, the Grammys, any other ceremony you can think of. But, yeah. But um, this, is, this is a wonderful thing right now, you know. The school, this school right here, y'all get, to, y'all get to, to, like, really focus in on what y'all want to do. Y'all ain't got to waste y'all time with, you know, electives, karate, swimming, stuff like that. <laughs> y'all get to really do what y'all want to do, you know, not waste time. I, I know correct. tuition is is a little upper, but <laughs> but I heard but I heard that y'all get um, Je- I think Jessica was telling me she's out there somewhere where it's called like a life learning, um, career learning where you can come back, you know, and 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 and, and um, freshen up on you know your feel. So yeah, yeah. all right, we got about six minutes. Oh in God. six minutes, we'll do question and answer. So I have about two more questions in six <laughs> minutes. <laughs> uh, last, well, we got about two more questions. But uh, y'all are always on campus. Y'all came here before. Y'all performed. Uh, tell us about last year when y'all performed. It was last year, right? July, I think. Yeah, it was this past summer. That was a, that was amazing. Like, and and uh, to add on to what a little bit Clutch is saying. I didn't get a chance to say who I would work with, but I would love to work with y'all. Like, it's not about the superstars that you got to spend fifty thousand dollars to get the feature. It's not. We don't. We're not a feature-heavy group. If you look at every all our albums, we have no features. We don't care. It's too many of us fighting for position on verses to let fifty thousand dollars go for. You know, I'd rather work with y'all on our future projects. I would love to work with who's up in the mixing department, who's in audio, and let, let y'all get a crack at mixing a couple records. Or, or a talented videographer that's about to blow and has great ideas, they just don't have the, the right artist to, to put in front of the camera. Those are the things that inspire me, and that's why I'm gonna keep coming until I find what I want out of y'all, because this is like, it's easy. I'm picking from the cream of the crop for whatever I need, and it's, it's a no-brainer. Like, who would not want to take this opportunity? I'm thinking, what would Rick Ross do if he was sitting here? Would he take advantage of that? Would he, and he's a very smart guy. Would he pick the top five, or would he work with the ones that need the help the most and bring them up? But 
I think the opportunity for us is here right now to find the best of the best and the most innovative, because we're an older group. We're not old school, we're not new school, we're like kind of in limbo in between. And to find people that are innovative and cutting edge on new technologies and new ideas and new ways to do stuff, is, is that opportunity uh, to, to not take that would be foolish on my behalf. You know what I'm saying? So. What was your question, Al? Yeah. Al? That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, the question was, uh, tell us about last year. Y'all oh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Right, That's what, okay, that was a segue. The, the performance last year was dope because it was students that put on the whole, the whole show. They ran the lights, the sound. The sound check was dope. Man, y'all were on point. That was so on point because it was just like y'all didn't have to be there. You know what I'm saying? And maybe I did for the class, but some people that do that, they do it every day and, all, and they get tired and they don't want to sound check. They don't want you to sound check. They, you should have came to sound check and I would have cut your vote, you know? It's like, no, man, just do your job right and I do my job right. But that, the last year's show, I forgot what, what building it was in, but it was, it was amazing. It was like, and it was small, it was, it, was, it was a quaint and like a boutique type of show. And I'm just imagining if this was outside, on the real sound system, and y'all sound, y'all system, y'all technology, the equipment y'all use is A1. And to be in front of that, and for us, it could have been just a little practice that we just did that. It's like, let's just go through a couple songs and end up having a full-fledged concert and got into it because y'all were into it. And to do that, you know, I don't want to keep doing that every, you know, three months because I think we'll play ourselves out, but, you know, a once a year where we get the, the students a chance to, to show off their skills and what they learn with a group that you know, does ha have my great mic presence and the lighting can follow the person without bumping into the artists that don't know what they're doing. I think the opportunity to, for us to get our music out and for you guys to train, I think that should happen more often than not. I mean, you said it. I don't know. I ain't, ain't much I can say. Um, <clears throat> my bad. It was, yeah. Now, um, it hit me more when I, when I looked at it on the other side of that coin, like, you know what I'm saying? It's almost like when you do, because we do like 200 dates a year. You know what I mean? We're away from our families, you know, almost three quarters of every year. You know what I mean? Just on the road, traveling, doing shows. 200 different shows every year. And sometimes you could look at each one of them like, that's just another show. What's the next one? But when, uh, when I kind of looked at it from you guys' perspective, man, and just to be able to work on a production, you know what I mean? What's going on? Be able to work... Again, not again, though. No. We ain't said that. But now, um, to look at it from you guys' perspective, man, that, that gave me a whole new inspiration. Because I was like, man, that's right. Dude, the students ran that whole thing. You guys ran the whole production. From the lighting to the sound to, you know, setting up the monitors, the wedges where we can hear, you know, where we need to hear our music. You know, uh, to making sure that bass was hitting right and, and everybody on the mixing board, some people on the cameras doing, you know, taping it, doing the live footage, going around, you know what I'm saying, doing the live shot and all of that. And when I looked at it from that perspective, it made it a lot more special to me. And it was just like, man, you know, that's that hands-on training that I'm, that I'm talking about. Like, that's that experience that don't everybody get to get. So you might complain about the tuition right now, but trust me, you guys are definitely privileged in what y'all do here, man. I mean, like, you know, y'all get to work on and work with some of the top-notch people in the industry, man. So some, some people would pay for that, just that experience alone. You know, you guys are learning something that's, uh, that's going to change the industry, man, and keep, and keep our job going. You know, we need you guys just as much as, you know, you guys need us. So that's, that's kind of what I learned from, from that last performance. What's up? Ryan, real quick. Man, uh, it was great. I'll keep it simple. It was great. Um, Jessica... She was there then. She showed us a lot of love. She's showing us love now. Um, like I said earlier, man, it was that with the with the induction yesterday and then the show last year, it was it was definitely like on some I keep going back to the Grammys, but it, it was it was it was like award winning, you know. I might be kinda throwing it on thick, but y'all are definitely the future of entertainment to the level where it's like, you know, this is going to be big. You know, y'all the future, like, rappers, mixers, directors, lighting people. Uh, who, who, what else is in here that y'all doing? Um, video. Film, video, management, business, you know, artist management. So all aspects of the game 
is sitting in this room right now. So, you know, take full advantage, savor this moment, and, um, you know, just when, when, it, when it gets hard to where you like, man, you know, I don't know if I can do this. Just remember that, I don't remember who said this yesterday, but it, um, the quote was, and I'm going to get this right, it was, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So those are words to live by. I, want, I also wanted to add one, another little quote that um, we heard when we first got signed to Atlantic, uh, the guy by the name of Ahmed Erdogan, who's, who founded Atlantic Records, you know, his, uh, his slogan was, you know, anybody can continue on that path. Like when you, you know, when you set yourself up on a path, you can continue straight down that path, you know? And um, that's cool. But what's even cooler is if sometimes you you stay on the pad, but you might vary a little bit from side to side and maybe walk with a swag and bump into this guy, bump into that guy, bump into that chick, bump into this person. And uh, you never know what those bumps might cause as far as a ripple effect in your future, your life. So, you know what I'm saying? Keep that, keep that swag about yourself. Stay on the path that you set. At the same time, you know, look around. Don't, don't be tunnel vision in it. Look around, man, and, and network with these people around you. Because to me, this is a pot of gold right in this room right here. Like, I'm looking at the gold nuggets in each one of these little seats, man. This, this, is, this is what, you know, makes me feel like, you know, the music industry is going to definitely have a, a, a continue a great future, man. And so you guys keep on digging, man. Keep on doing what you're doing, man. God bless each and every one of y'all, and good luck in the future. That's what's up. Great insight today. This includes our in-depth look at Nappy Roots discussion. Thank you, Nappy Roots. Everybody give a, another hand of applause. Thank you, Aldo. Bye, everybody. <laughs>